Well, I think that, then there's a strong case for, for treating precedent as a matter of common law. This common law can be displaced by statute. Congress has the authority to enact genuine precedent rules under its power to pass necessary and proper laws for carrying into execution the judicial power. Just as Congress can pass rules of procedure that govern the federal court, Congress can pass rules of precedent that govern federal courts. So having argued that the Constitution allows precedent, let me turn to the task of describing what a normatively desirable and principled precedent approach would look like. Now, obviously, I don't really have time to fully do that, but let me at least sketch what I think that approach would be, how one would develop it, what, what it would look like, and give something of a flavor of it. As a consequentialist or utilitarian, I believe that precedent should be followed, should be employed only in cases where the benefits of doing so exceed the cost, uh, exceed the benefits, excuse me, of following the original meaning. All right, so, so to develop this theory, what one would do is to first look to the benefits of following the original meaning, and then look to follow what the benefits are of, of following precedent, and then once we've cataloged these benefits, one would then be in a position to develop judicially manageable precedent rules, right? So let me just mention um, first two of the benefits, I think, of following the original meaning. The first benefit of following the original meaning of the Constitution is that the original meaning is likely to be desirable. Okay? And this desirability derives from the fact that the Constitution was enacted pursuant to strict supermajority rules. And a Constitution enacted pursuant to strict supermajority rules is likely to have a variety of virtues, including being supported by a consensus and also having desirable provisions because it's enacted behind a kind of limited veil of ignorance that the supermajority rules provide. And it's really these sort of supermajority or consensus requirements that are responsible for many of the celebrated features of our Constitution, such as the Bill of Rights and constitutional federalism, which were the result of compromises as a result of those supermajority rules. Now, a second benefit of following the original meaning is that it protects the, the supermajoritarian constitutional amendment process. If you think about it, to pass a constitutional amendment, it often takes time to develop the very strong consensus necessary to do so. But if the Supreme Court updates the Constitution every time a significant number of people believe that constitutional change is needed, then the court is going to preempt the constitutional amendment process before it has a chance to operate. And thus, non-originalism is going to undermine the constitutional amendment process. OK, so against these two benefits of of following the original meaning. Uh, we can compare the, the several benefits, and there are other benefits of following the original meaning, but um, two for now, we can compare the several benefits of following precedent, um, which due to their familiarity and the time constraints here, I'm just gonna list, all right? So we've got clarity and predictability and protection of reliance and equal treatment and stability, right? These various benefits of, of um, Precedent. So, so we got these benefits of the original meaning, the benefits of precedent in mind. The next task would be then to develop a doctrine of precedent. And what that doctrine would attempt to do would be to develop rules that identify situations where the benefits of following the precedent would outweigh the benefits of following the original meaning. Now, it's essential that that doctrine employ rules as much as possible because such rules are gonna be needed to prevent judges from exercising the discretion over which precedents to follow. We, we, we don't want that. Um, well, here, let me, just given the, the time constraints, let me mention just two of the several rules that I recommend. And the first rule is a pretty straightforward one. It said that precedent ought to be followed when overturning a precedent would result in enormous costs. Um, so this means not only should we follow the precedents that affirm social security and paper money, but we should not return fully to the pre-New Deal Commerce Clause, right? Because returning to the pre-New Deal Commerce Clause would change or eliminate, cut back numerous programs from, wide, from, from environmental protection to securities regulation and really cause widespread disruption. 
But this, this rule of enormous cost would still allow many precedents to be overturned. For example, the courts could overrule Humphrey's executor and Morrison versus Olson to hold that independent agencies are unconstitutional. Right? That would be a big change, but it would not involve enormous costs. The second rule grows out of the supermajoritarian character of the Constitution. And it's the second rule is that we should protect what I call entrenched precedents. Right? So what's an entrenched precedent? It's a precedent that's supported by a supermajoritarian consensus that's comparable to the consensus necessary to pass a constitutional amendment. Right? So that, that really strong level of support for an entrenched precedent suggests it may be as desirable as any provision in the Constitution because it has a similar degree of support. So under this rule, I think that, we, that certain cases that have that degree of support, such as Brown versus Board of Education, should be followed and protected but not other cases that are more controversial, such as force busing or affirmative action. Griswold ought to be protected, but not Roe. Mid-level scrutiny for gender ought to be protected, but not the exclusionary rule. Well, these rules are just two of the several that I think a complete doctrine of precedent would, would employ, but I think it, at the very least they give a flavor of what that doctrine would look like. The doctrine would be a sort of intermediate approach, which would allow precedent only in the situations where it's most beneficial. In the end, then, I think that originalism allows not only for precedent, but it allows for an ideal precedent doctrine. And under such a doctrine, the mistakes of the past cannot all be reversed. Instead, an ideal doctrine would keep those precedents that are too costly to overturn but would otherwise allow the original meaning to reign free. Are we on? Sorry.